Welcome to the first CARE panel of 2022. Um, we'll be discussing the ethics of animal research today. Uh, the Center for Ethics and Human Values CARE program aims to go beyond discussions of regulatory requirements, and hopefully we delve more deeply into some of the underlying um, issues of research that you all face um, on an everyday basis. Um, the program is sponsored by the Office of Research with support from the OSUMC um, Center for Bioethics and the College of Public Health. And I'm delighted to have such a great group of discussions from multiple perspectives um, with us today. So first we have Rebecca Walker, who is Professor of Philosophy and Professor of Social Medicine at UNC and is also a core faculty member at the Center for Bioethics at UNC. Professor Walker brings years of expertise and scholarship about how to, how to think about animal research and translating theoretical arguments into practice. Um, she's written extensively on the ethics of research um, in biomedical settings, including animal research, phase one healthy volunteer research, and genomic advances. And she's currently working on a book entitled Of Mice and Primates, Virtue Ethics and Animal Research. Welcome Rebecca, and we're gonna start off with Rebecca to give a sort of overview of the way in which you've been thinking about some of the underlying ethical issues. We'll then go to our distinguished Ohio State panel of experts. So we have um, uh, Rustin Moore, who is a veterinarian, an equine surgeon, a researcher, and a zoo zooia advocate. Um, he's also the Dean of the College of Veter Veterinary Medicine at Ohio State University. His research and advocacy has focused on the human-animal bond, on One Health, and the need and importance of veterinarians to be engaged in research. And we also have Scott McGraw, who is an evolutionary anatomist and primary behavioralist with primary research interests in Africa. He's also currently the chair of the anthropology department. Professor McGraw, McGraw's research has also involved conservation efforts and the detrimental ro role of anthropogenic, anthropogenic activities, human activities <laughs> on primate life. Um, so we're so excited to have all of you here. Um, for those who are new to these sessions, the structure is we're gonna have the first 15 minutes or so. Um, Rebecca will begin with a presentation. We'll then have an opportunity for um, Rustin and for Scott to sort of bring your own expertise and background thinking about these issues as practitioners and researchers. And then I have a few questions that we sort of talked about, but as always, it's up to you, uh, audience, to sort of get your own, you know, your own um, questions um, to the table and to generate discussion. So throughout the conversation, you'll see at the bottom, there's a Q&A icon. Please feel free to click away and write any questions that you may have. And we're gonna try and leave the last 20 minutes for discussion um, from the questions that you have. So without further ado, um, Rebe Rebecca, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, hi, um, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. And um, I'm really excited to be talking with you all, um, especially excited to learn from uh, the other panelists uh, about their perspectives. But I'm gonna start us off um, with a few slides and I'm going to play this slide from the beginning. There we go, okay. So, um, I put my uh, email address here and my webpage in case anyone wants to get in touch with me and continue the conversation. I'm happy to respond to email, or if you wanna go down the rabbit hole of actually looking at um, any of my research, that's all up on my webpage. And um, again, my background is, uh, I'm a philosopher by trainings and my background is in moral theory. So that's kind of how um, I approach these issues. And so, uh, again, uh, my perspective has really been focused on thinking about biomedical research uses, and that's um, quite different, I think, from uh, some of the perspectives that our other panelists will bring. So I'm really excited to hear more about their um, experiences. But in terms of how I've been thinking about things, I would divide up my interest into sort of three broad categories. One is to think about um, 
the guidance that covers animal and human subject research and what the ethical principles are that underlies that guidance and how, if at all, it should be different depending on what kinds of subjects that we're um, addressing. So that's one sort of set of research questions. The second set of research questions has to do with my, again, background in philosophy and thinking about moral theory and how moral theories uh, relate to our everyday practices. And my interest there has been thinking about how moral theories intersect with animal research, and in particular, what virtue ethics can contribute to that uh, conversation. And because I think that virtue ethics has something distinctive to say about the actual practice of animal research, I've also been uh, really interested in looking up at um, the practice itself and on the ground issues that arise for animal researchers and how animal researchers navigate and understand the ethical issues in the context of the work that they do. Um, so it won't be a surprise to anyone to know that animal subject research and human subject research are guided by very different regulatory strategies from the um, groups that oversee this work most directly. So in the human subject case in the US, institutional review boards, in the animal subject case in the US, um, institutional animal care and use committees, to the regulations themselves that are very different depending on whether we're talking about human subjects or animal subjects. That's, I think, certainly no surprise to anyone. What's interesting to me as an ethicist is that the ethical principles that underwrite these different regulatory strategies are themselves different. And so in the US and in many places around the world, when we think about human subject research, we bring to bear the principles of respect for persons, beneficence and justice. Um, whereas in the animal subject context, we're really concerned with welfare and a kind of a, um, a way of looking at welfare where we're interested in maximizing welfare to the extent um, compatible with the aims of the science. And so that's a kind of a, a way of thinking about beneficence, but it doesn't really bring to bear either respect on the one hand or justice on the other hand. And the three R's are um, the principles that have been most commonly thought of in this context of animal welfare, where we reduce the number of animals that are used in research, we replace sentient animals where possible with other methods, and we refine the use of animals so that we're able to do studies that are most compatible with their welfare. And so one of the things that really interests me is why uh, we have these different approaches, not just the different regulatory strategies, but why the underlying ethical principles are themselves different for thinking about these different subjects. And I think there are broadly three different kinds of explanations one could give. I think all of these explanations have problems. And so the sort of big picture question for me is, which one of these explanations is the best? Is it sufficient? And what are the sort of underlying problems with them? So one underlying explanation is that human and non-human animals um, have different moral status. And because of that, we need to use different moral principles in thinking about their use. This is a very controversial claim um, philosophically. The one thing I would say about this is that if you look at the regulatory structures themselves, they don't really refer to moral status as a rationale for the differences in why humans and animals are um, treated with different uh, sort of uh, oversight and standards. Um, so I think that's, that's I'm gonna leave that one aside, but we can, we can come back to it. The second thing you might say is that moral status aside, uh, human and non-human animals have very different kinds of capacities and interests such that, for example, um, uh, respect for animals is not really something that uh, 
make sense in accordance with their capacities and interests or justice isn't really a principle that's relevant to their capacities and interests. I think that's also um, questionable and certainly something that we can come back to again. And the third thing that I actually think is the most promising um, explanation that hasn't really been given much attention is to say, well, these uh, research endeavors are just really different on the ground in terms of their structure. And so uh, where one set of principles might make sense for human subjects, that doesn't really translate very well to the animal context. So for example, if you take um, consent, it makes a lot of sense that you would need to talk about uh, respect for persons and consent where you have subjects that are free to choose to volunteer or not to volunteer for research. It doesn't really make sense where you have subjects that are for the large part purchased and um, used um, as a matter of course in the research enterprise and consent doesn't really um, uh, come to bear. So again, I think there are examples that sort of uh, break that um, barrier from veterinary research on the one hand to um, phase one human subject research on the other and um, we can come come back to that, I'm just giving you the big picture now. Um, so that's one sort of set of research questions I've been interested in. And the second set has to do with, I said, uh, moral theories and how those relate to animal research. And there I think the uh, different approaches that we've typically seen from philosophy have been either rights-based uh, theories or utilitarian views. So for rights-based theories, the sort of primary question I would say is which non-human animals have what kinds of rights and what are the implications of those rights for their use in biomedical research? And you could have roughly three different approaches. You could have a strong view where you would want to abolish at least harmful uses of animals. You could have a limited rights view where you would give animals um, basic protections or you would give certain species certain kinds of protections, or you could say there are no rights um, that non-human animals have, but we still have to treat them humanely in research. For utilitarian view, the big question I think is, how do we take non-human animal interests into account when we're trying to maximize overall welfare? And there you really have a kind of a um, tension between the more philosophical perspective that you get from someone like Peter Singer, who says we ought to give an equal consideration to like human and non-human animal interests, regardless of species. And on the other hand, you would have um, the welfare perspective that you get um, from the uh, oversight um, uh, view itself, which is a kind of utilitarian view, arguing that um, animal research is justified because of overall benefit but you would probably have to say that non-human animal interests are discounted in the balancing of um, benefits and harms. So as I said, um, whoops. My, uh, my interest has been in thinking about what virtue ethics can add to this picture. The take home message really is that those rights views and utilitarian views respond really well to questions about justification. So whether and when animal research is justified, but they don't say much of anything at all about the practice of animal research. And virtue ethics, because it's focused on uh, what the well-lived life looks like and what flourishing is like, um, and what the character traits are of the practically wise person um, has more of a capacity to kind of reach into uh, animal research practices and uh, deal with questions like what kinds of habits are good ones for an ethical next generation of researcher? Um, how do human animal bonds impact our duties of care for animals in a research context? And um, what kinds of species um, flourish uh, better or worse in research environments and why is that an ethically significant question. So that's been uh, what I've been focused on in my work. And now just my, for some reason I'm having the worst time with uh, 
making my slides go forward, but this is the last one. Because I've been interested in those kind of um, questions that really have to do with on the ground issues in animal research, I also have an empirical uh, part of the work that I do. Some of it comes from this broader research project uh, that I have with my colleague, Jill Fisher, who's a sociologist at UNC um, called the Comparative Model Organism Research Ethics Project. And that's comparing um, non-human animal research and phase one human studies. But as part of that, we've interviewed um, a number of animal researchers about their views and animal research oversight personnel. And we did a survey recently, just this last year. Um, and that data is out um, uh, in a publication on our website might be of interest to people. And some of the questions that have driven that research are uh, questions like, how do researchers think about these oversight questions and the three Rs? What do they think are the perceived reasons for the poor rates of translational success between animal research, human subject research, and um, uh, medications that may come out of that process? Uh, what are the barriers to better transparency in the animal research process? And how do they um, consider the moral significance of animal harms that might happen as part of the at least biomedical research endeavor? So those are the different things I've been focused on. I'm gonna stop now and really look forward to hearing from other folks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. And um, maybe next we'll hear from Rustin, who will give uh, your perspective um, as a veterinary surgeon and researcher um, and the Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here and uh, happy to share my experiences and uh, perspectives. Um, so just as a little background, I uh, uh, do have a deep, I am a veterinarian and have a PhD and I'm um, board certified in veterinary surgery, particularly large animal. Um, starting in about 1989, when I graduated from veterinary school and until uh, 2006, I've been involved in various levels of research, mostly in the area of equine gastrointestinal disease or colic and some of the associated conditions that follow that, such as sepsis, endotoxemia, laminitis, and other things. So during that time, I've also um, trained uh, uh, over 20 graduate students and over 25 uh, interns and residents. So, and, and, and a lot of that was uh, also training uh, or experiences in research. So since coming back to Ohio State after being uh, at LSU for 12 years, I haven't really been involved directly in research uh, for the last 15 years. Uh, since I've become uh, an, an, uh, an administrator. Uh, but uh, during that same time, I have continued to be an advocate for um, uh, biomedical research, uh, both for animals and for people, and to make sure we do it in ways that are ethical and uh, treat the animals with, in, in my view, with respect and dignity and compassion um, and look out for their health and welfare. So, um, you know, I've always, taken that very seriously, those last few things that I mentioned, even during my research, I will say that most of the research that I did for my PhD did involve the use of animals in terminal research. Uh, fortunately, um, if one way to look at it, uh, most of the horses that I used were destined for euthanasia anyway, for other reasons, and everything that was uh, done to them uh, to advance the field uh, was done under anesthesia, and then they were humanely uh, euthanized without waking up from anesthesia. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention in veterinary medicine anyway today, clinical trials are becoming more and more common. Uh, these are uh, trials of animals with naturally acquired or spontaneous disease, and they're used uh, in trials to evaluate new diagnostics, new preventives, new devices, new treatments, not only for people, but also for themselves. Uh, I'll give, give you a few examples. For dogs, for example, dogs are a pretty good model uh, for um, uh, studying cancer in, in people, as well as arthritis and other things. Uh, for example, uh, osteosarcoma, which is a relatively prevalent uh, type of cancer in large breed dogs that occurs spontaneously, is a really nice model that is predictive, uh, quite predictive of, of uh, what might happen from a biologic behavior or response to treatment in adolescents with 
uh, bone cancer. And, you know, most of the, so these are clinical trials. And so trying new uh, chemotherapeutics or new uh, other types of, of cancer treatments uh, can be quite helpful, not just for other dogs or for, or for youth, but sometimes for that patient itself. Now, I, you know, I, I sort of think about um, using animals in research either as, you know, uh, like with people, whether they're participants or whether they're, you know, subjects that are enrolled or, or used. Um, you know, there are situations in people where um, somebody is advocating for them or consenting for them. They're not consenting themselves, whether it's, you know, uh, a, a, a baby or, or a, a youth or uh, someone with Alzheimer's or dementia or some other issue. And so I, I look at that similar to what I look at for animals that are owned or they are, uh, you know, they have what we refer to as pet parents or caretakers. They're not consenting to those clinical trials. The owner or the caretaker is. And so those, I think, are things very similar and that we could draw some parallels around. So, you know, the one thing, at least in many of the studies that we do for clinical trials, uh, where the owner clearly does give consent, we're typically comparing a new treatment to a gold standard. I don't never like to use gold standard, but the current thinking of gold standard, or we're adding it onto gold standard uh, and comparing the two back to just the gold standard by themselves. So uh, rarely are we just um, you know giving placebos um, and, and not providing the, the at least the optimal care that we know of at the time. Um, so um, probably uh, time to wrap up for this question, but the one thing I want to say as a veterinarian and veterinary practitioners, we often have to consider the, the implications of treatments that we are providing to patients that aren't even enrolled in clinical trials. I mean, you know, we're always evaluating the patient and, and trying to translate um, and sometimes it's the only thing left to try to do. And of course, we have those conversations with the owner or the caretaker, but that's something uh, really important. And the final thing I'll say, you know, we have, I have a lot of conflict actually, when, when, when you look at our veterinarian's oath and uh, the, the oath uh, says that we are to protect animal health and welfare, prevent, relief, pre prevent and relief of suffering, while also advancing medical knowledge and promotion of public health. Well, there's a whole lot wrapped up in those few words that to me there is, is a dichotomy, there is potential conflict. And so we have to continually, I think all of us as veterinarians have to weigh that in, uh, every single time we're looking at a patient or we're thinking about research um, and, and do what we think is the right thing. And I think the way I can justified in those situations for me is if I'm going to you know follow the three R's from before but also add the fourth R of respect and you know and, and what I mean by that is respect the animal for how we are utilizing the animal but also to treat them with dignity and with make sure their health well-being welfare all those are taken care of so I'll stop there Thank you so much. And Scott, do you want to just bring your own perspective? Sure. And, and this is going to be a bit different. And if I can share my screen here. I fear that I have put together a little presentation, which is likely too long. So uh, where are we? can you see that? We can see your screen. Yeah, now we can see it. Okay. So, yeah, this is a bit different. Um, this is just a, some thoughts on some of the ethical issues that I deal with um, in the, the, the field work that I do in Africa. Uh, some background. So, we've been working in, in West Africa for about 35 years in the Thai forest, uh, which is one of the last blocks of rainforest intact left in West Africa. Um, the study began as a, as a project between a couple of universities to study the, the predator-prey dynamics between chimpanzees, who were well known for the choreographed way in which they hunted monkeys, and the other side of that dynamic, which 
it was the monkeys themselves. So, so we began in the, in the late 80s and we have been studying the eight monkey species ever since. Um, a number of those monkeys are considered critically endangered. So I guess the first point that I would make is that even if the science that we're doing is bad, um, the fact that we are able to maintain a presence in the forest has provided significant protection uh, for these animals. And we are obliged to continue to do that for a number of reasons. The first of which, and probably the most important of which, is that in West Africa, poaching is rampant. Bushmeat is the high premium put on bushmeat. And for example, we go into the forest and we can hear, even though we're in a national park, we can hear gunshots around our primary study grid every day. Um, so there's tremendous hunting pressure on these animals. So the first decision we had to make was whether or not we wanted to habituate the animals to get them to not fear humans. Because the reason that there were animals left there was that they learned to run away from humans. Um, the project first got its funding from the Swiss National Science Foundation. And so the individual who started the project got all kinds of surplus Swiss army shirts. And our forest assistants still wear those today because they became habituated to the shirts rather than the humans. We wanted them to not run away when our field assistants uh, went into the forest. Um, but if they saw someone who was not wearing that shirt, they would flee. And it seems to still work. So I guess the, the second point is the ethics of habituation. What, does, what, does the, what is the responsibility that we have to ourselves and the animals given that these animals now have lost their fear of humans? And we can get very close to these animals. Um, and this, this has caused some problems. Um, there's an aggression curve that animals undergo when they're habituating. First, there's a, a bit of aggression, then it peaks. And then gradually it goes away, but there are things that can happen during that process which can be detrimental to both the animals and humans. Activity budgets absolutely change. Until those animals give up running, they are going to spend far more time running than they are feeding themselves. And that can have detrimental costs. They're going to expand their home range and they're going to compromise their ability to feed themselves, which is not good. We're habituating groups within a study group, within a study grid, but that is going to alter the interaction between the habituated groups and those non-habituated groups beside them. Individuals leave their natal groups and they go transfer into another group, but if you've got a female who wants to leave her group, moving into a habituated group, she might be reluctant to do that, which can obviously affect not only the transfer dynamics, but also the reproductive biology of the animals. Um, one of the first things that we were interested in, was in doing was studying the predator prey dynamics, not just between the monkeys and the chimps, but the leopards and the monkey eating eagles. We had very good evidence early on that predators were staying away from our study grid because we were in it. And that had a major effect on the behavior of the animals. Animals that were normally found high in the trees became over habituated and they would come down to the ground and you'd see animals that should never have been on the ground running around exposing themselves to parasites that they otherwise would not have. Um, and then of course, getting this close to the animals and altering their behavior does, does raise their, their stress levels, which could have lots of consequences down the line. Um, so just an example, we did lots of experiments with with how the different animals would respond to leopards. So we got these little leopard bathrobes and we would dress individuals up and we would record how they behaved. And it was wonderful, but we became very um, conscious of the fact that this had long-term effects after those experiments were over with. So we, we then had to change our schedule and change the groups that we were conducting these experiments on. Um, of course, there's the, there's the disease notion, and this is, a two-way street, often think of, of the dangers of contracting diseases from, from the non-human primates. And of course, in West Africa, this is an acute problem. We've got Ebola in the forest. 
lots of bush meat, arbor viruses. We now have last year the first evidence that the chimps can get leprosy. One of our primary study species is the Sudi mangabe, which is a natural reservoir for SIV, which when it jumped became HIV2. We're studying the interaction between that and its microbiome. But we also know that the street can go the other direction and, and that if individuals, for example, bring a common cold into the forest, it could have tremendously deleterious effects on, on the animals. Um, and by the way, I just I was, when I was looking at this, uh, the, the mask business, I did this study just came out that showed that in portions of Southeast Asia, there are lots of non-human primates that are, that are catching diseases from, from discarded uh, face masks, which is terribly ironic. Um, a couple other things. Um, outside of complete habitat destruction or hunting, there are a few things that you can do that will disrupt an ecosystem worse than, than putting a road through. So um, this, is our, this is our field camp and it's pretty nice. And this is the road right before you get to the field camp. But this is what the road looks like when you turn off the main road. And we have, we have tried to be very mindful to not make our entry into the field station inviting in order to keep visitors and other researchers out. Um, we don't want visitors. Um, and we're trying to keep the system as intact as possible for a number of reasons. Of course, we all know about deforestation and there are some abrupt borders between forests and the farms that are replacing those forests. Huge literature now about what we owe primates who are coming out of the forest and taking advantage of cultivated land. And it's, it's uh, it's a, a very contentious topic at all the primate conferences. Um, the anthropology all the, of all of this, there are human behaviors, cultural norms that will I guess, challenge our moral compass. I did some survey work looking for um, the monkey that's pictured here on the bottom, which is considered one of the 25 most endangered species in the world. And when we went to the forest trying to do some survey work, we actually went to the park guards and we found that the park guards family had actually one of those species tied up and was keeping it as a pet. So what is our obligation um, at that point to both the, the cultural anthropology of, of that part of the, of the world and the animals themselves? A couple other things. Um, what is our obligation to intervene when we see things that we think we could help Chimpanzees obviously spend time both in the trees and on the ground. One of the ways that humans hunt is by using these wire snares, which of course don't discriminate what they're hunting. And so one, one, another, another debate which is ongoing is what do you do when you see a chimp who has a snare on its limb? Um, should you intervene and risk upsetting the habituation of the whole group dynamic or should you just let nature take its course. And there is, there's no consensus as to what the, what the solution to that is. Interesting paper that came out, by the way, just a couple of years ago is that there's evidence that these chimps are able to recognize these snares and they go out of their way to deactivate them. So very, very bright animals. Lastly, um, and this is just an anecdote, um, I owe the animals at, at the field site a tremendous amount. They basically are responsible for my career this is the red colobus monkey on the left. I remember one day early on in my PhD work where I saw something moving on the ground. I was thinking it maybe was a, a diker or, or, some, or a bush pig or something, but it turned out to be a red colobus. And it was that red colobus. I got closer. I knew something was wrong. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but it has a compound fracture in its thigh. It was covered with maggots, it clearly had jumped and fallen and broken its leg. I knew this animal was going to die. And I was sort of thinking to myself that the information that I could glean from it, um, its study of its anatomy might allow me to get more grant support to keep the project running, but I would have to kill it. And it was a real dilemma as to, as to what I was going to do. And so I went over it in my head. Eventually I did 
I did uh, cause it to expire, but I really wonder whether I would do that now, given, given what I know. Um, and then the last thing is, once again, the study animals at our site are, are safe. We do pro provide protection, but they are extremely vulnerable. Um, we, we have to maintain a permanent presence in the forest. Otherwise, we know that, that the, the, the hunters would come in quickly. And I, we know that for a fact because there's been only one day during the 35 years that I've been involved with this project when the forest assistants left. Um, Liberian soldiers came in, all the assistants left, went to their villages. And during that one day, hunters went in and wiped out um, an entire study group. So they're both safe and vulnerable at the same time. And so we are ethically bound to Okay, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Um, so one of the reasons why I'm just like so excited to start this conversation because it's clear that the three of you are just have been think been so thoughtful about these issues, but coming from very different enterprises, um, as Rebecca so um, helpfully um, sort of highlighted um, during your presentation. So I have a few questions, um, but th this is just another reminder for the audience. If you have any questions, please feel free to um, type them up in the Q and A. Um, but yeah, I mean maybe. Um, before like jumping into um, some more details, maybe starting off with a general question. So what on your view, I've, I've heard a bunch of different things. I've heard gratitude, I've heard compassion, I've heard um, protection. So what on your view do we owe um, non-human animals who participate in research? Respect, um, safekeeping um, are the same things that we owe non-human animals uh, what we owe to human participants of research, or are they different? Um, and I would love to hear from your perspective, given that you're coming from very different um, uh, sort of, you know, you're engaging with different potential research participants and or patient populations. So um, it would, I would love to hear your thoughts on what you think researchers owe to the animals that are part of the research. And maybe I will start with, um, Rustin, and then um, Rebecca or Scott, you could go afterwards. Sure, well, I certainly believe that we owe them respect and safekeeping and compassion, but it goes beyond that. Um, some of the other words that were used, I, I, I think um, we owe them dignity, um, whether they are you know, laboratory research animals or animals in clinical trials. You know, a lot has changed over the last several decades, uh, how society views animals. Uh, and, and part of that is based on research, and part of that is based on how uh, animals, and in particular pets, have been, been, been humanized um, and, you know, have gone from outside to not only inside, but into our beds. Um, so, you know, 70% of people in the U.S. have at least one pet. 90% of those who have them feel like they're a member of the family. Up to 75% of them allow them to sleep on their bed. Americans spend over 100 about $110 billion just this past year on pets. Um, women who um, are victims of domestic violence won't leave those situations if they have a pet for fear of what will happen to the pet. And homeless people uh, won't uh, get rid of their pets so they can go into housing. Those all talk about the strength of the human animal bond and the power of a pet. And so I think that's something that really drives this too today. And quite frankly, it's not just for those that are owned or, or you know, people who take care of pets, but also I think it extends into the, the research space. Certainly uh, as veterinarians, you know, every, every institution that conducts animal research has to have an institutional veterinarian. And those institutional veterinarians have to have more advanced training in specifically that, uh, that area. And so those are things that I know that the veterinarians, the veterinary technicians, veterinary assistants, caretakers, those things weigh heavily on them. And, you know, they're always doing uh, the right thing. And, and the right thing is really, really highly regulated by the uh, Animal Welfare Act, the Public Health Service Policy on the humane care uh, and use of lab animals, uh, 
but then each institution has their eye of cooks. Um, and then beyond that, the accrediting body. So it's highly regulated. And I think one thing that needs to happen is those need to be reviewed on a regular basis, uh, assessed and, and updated where, where possible. And not all regulations are necessarily in the best interest of the animal. For example, there uh, is a, a regulation that you have to go in and count the mouse pups before you wean them um, so that you know how many animals might be used in research. That's very, very stressful on the, on the mother as well as them. So what purpose does it really provide with regard to their health and welfare? I, and so that's just an example that sometimes I don't think we need regulation for regulation's sake. We need to think about regulations to protect and care for and ensure the welfare of those animals. Rebecca, do you have any sort of overarching way in which you've been thinking about this issue? Yeah, I mean, I didn't really sort of specifically say this in my presentation, but I don't actually think there's a good argument for why the ethical principles themselves that underlie um, animal and human subject research should be different. Um, and so I do think that respect is relevant to animal subject research, uh, as is justice. So for example, for animals that have the ability to assent to research, I mean, consent, I think, is uh, beyond uh, the capacity of animal subjects. But assent um, is certainly within the capacity of some animals. That should be taken into account. Um, and we think about justice, I think we should think um, in the selection of animal subjects, for example, about whether the research might be used to benefit other non-human animals of a similar species. That seems to me to be a relevant ethical consideration. So I think these considerations are just as relevant to the animal subject case, although they may be quite different in terms of how they get kind of spelled out in the particular circumstances. And on the sort of, um, on the front of like, what, what would specific changes be, I think, low hanging fruit in terms of their regulatory structure would be um, on the one hand to take seriously the utilitarian sort of maximum benefit um, arguments that underlie um, the justification for animal research and to actually require that we do a more rigorous harm benefit analysis with any proposed research to make sure that that research is actually um, worth doing. And that's uh, a requirement um, in the EU. It's a general requirement in the US, but there's no specific harm benefit analysis that's required. Um, so I think that that could be really useful. Another thing I think is a kind of a low hanging fruit in terms of changes would be to actually place some stronger upper limits on permissible harms to animals in the research enterprise. Um, harm such that even if they were potentially beneficial would be sort of out of range of things that we think should be um, morally permitted in certain circumstances. So those are the kind of changes that I think would be more um, in line with taking those um, broader moral principles and applying them to the um, animal case as well. Thank you. And Scott, have you thought about ways in which what do we owe, what do you feel like you owe, you said gratitude at the end, but what, I mean, underlying, what are the values that you think you really do owe um, the animals that are participating, or that are part of your research? Right, yeah, yeah I, I agree with, with, with both Rustin and, and, and Rebecca, those, those words, respect and, and dignity. Um, I'd like to think that, that we're being as non-invasive as possible. Um, and that by maintaining our presence, we are sort of doing the entire collective a good by, by providing protection. Um, but I, I, it's interesting because I can't help but also consciously or, or unconsciously sort of prioritize some of the animals in the system over others. Mm -hmm. So there is 
in, in my mind, and I think in, in many of the people who are associated with the project, including the assistants, when you go from say a bird to a squirrel, to a bush pig, to a diker, to a monkey, to a chimp, I think everyone would agree that there is a difference when you go from monkey to chimp. So, I mean, chimpanzees are such extraordinary animals. Should they take priority in terms of protection and care, independent of their endangered status, over a dung beetle, for example? Um, and and I would probably say yes. I know many would disagree. So let me let me jump into. Um, I mean, this in some ways I think is a related question. There has been this push. Um, from the when it comes to research involving humans to no longer think of the them as subjects, even though it's still human subjects uh, protection, but to think of them as participants, right? Um, so we talk about research participants. Do you think that that kind of shift in framework would be helpful or um, clarifying in any way when it comes to animal research? Um, yeah, so, I, you know, um, and so maybe maybe I'll start with Rebecca for this question, and then Rustin or Scott, if you also want to chime in after that, um, just let me know. Yeah, I mean, I I think that makes a lot of sense. And again, in some kinds of research, so for the kind of research that Rustin does, for example, in the use of companion animals, that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, but you know, for the most part, animals that are used in biomedical research don't choose to participate in that research. Um, and there, there isn't sort of a, a human who cares for them who gives consent for their use. Um, so to think of them as participants seems to me to kind of um, gloss over um, the reality of their engagement in that research process. Um, so I, I, I think that gives a false impression of you know the actual use of animals uh, in 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 research. They're they're not participating <laughs> in that sense. To the extent that they can be made into participants, I think that's all for the better. But I think we we ought to um, be careful about that. Yeah, I would I would echo that strongly, and I would I would also say even those that we might deal with as veterinarians in clinical trials where their owner or pet parent is consenting for them, they're not participating. They're not, I mean, they're not willingly doing that. Um, you know, so I think we're splitting hairs, quite frankly, to call them participants or they're enrolled in or they're, you know, whatever. I mean, I, I do think at least there is another uh, advocate for them, i.e. their pet parent or their animal, uh, but also, you know, animals that are in you know, uh, using research that, that aren't owned by someone. There's also advocates and people looking after their health and welfare. And, and, and in, I know this could sound um, bad and I don't want it to be taken the wrong way, but in some ways, and I think even the pandemic has shown that in some ways, the animals that are in vivariums or in those research facilities, which are highly regulated, may it might be that they, uh, are treated better than many people. Uh, and I'm not even talking about people in research. If we think about, you know, the, the square footage they need, the temperature, the light, the food, the air quality, can, you know, the air change exchanges, et cetera. And then we have lots of humans who are homeless or, you know, they uh, are uh, food insecure. Uh, they lack basic health care. Um, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we lower those standards. I'm suggesting maybe we want to look at this a little broader from a holistic social perspective, um, because I think uh, those that are in that type of situation, um, although not willingly participating, they, um, for the most part, have really good care and oversight. Yeah, and I would just add from from a field perspective, we would argue that the animals are not only not participating, but we're pretending they don't even know that we're there, that we're just part of the scenery and that they've gotten so accustomed to us that we're just 
you know, a pot and plant, which of course isn't true. They're keenly aware that we're there, um, but we're pretending that they are, they are not participating in any way. One, one other thing, I think that's really important. And, you know, just for example, in some zoos where they, you know, they, they, I'll say positively reinforce and train animals to be able to, you know, take sample blood samples or do whatever, um, you know, again, they're not willingly particip participating, but they're, they're tolerating and probably because there's an enjoyment on the other end because of the, the, the positive reinforcement. So I think they're, are ways to gauge that from a behavioral perspective. Um, and if, if they didn't like it or they weren't willing to tolerate it, then we shouldn't be doing it to them. So uh, I think those things are, I think in zoos in particular are very, very important. Yeah, and just, just to clarify, that's a wonderful um, elaboration of um, the sort of concept I was alluding to in a much more abstract way by saying ascent, right? The right. sort of willingness. Yeah, that's a wonderful mm -hmm. um, elaboration of that. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question from um, the preset, and then we have two questions from the audience that I think are great. So I want to get to them as well. Um, so the COVID pandemic has raised some interesting and distinctive challenges related to animal research, or maybe it's just highlighted some of the challenges that have been there all along. Um, and so lots of people had to stop their research for a period of time, or had to think about how to do so ethically when it comes to the animals in their research. Um, there's also been interesting debates about whether or not to conduct anim, uh, animal, non-human animal challenge studies, especially when humans are like signing up petitions ready and willing to um, sign up for some COVID challenge studies. And so I'm wondering whether COVID has taught you or for you has highlighted any um, issues related to the ethics of conducting research. Um, so maybe I will start with um, Scott this time and then um, if Rebecca and Rustin want to um, join in, you're next. COVID really has is, is influenced our work only to the extent that we haven't been able to travel to, uh, to the site. However, our forest assistants have been uh, under the animals every day, fortunately. We are, we are still taking the precautions that we would have pre-COVID. Um, but in, in that sense, the, the only disruption has been sort of the traffic back and forth between um, the states and, and the field site. So it has not been a major disruption yet. Rustin, do you want to chime in? Um, well, you know, certainly with COVID in the beginning, um, some lab research labs had to close for periods of time. And um, there, there is a perception that that led to, um, well, I should say, perhaps perception and reality of having to euthanize mm -hmm. large numbers of research animals. And at least uh, the institutions that I'm aware of here, Ohio State and Nationwide Children's and talking with, with their folks, that really didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, uh, one, you know, what they were able to do was within existing guidelines of care, modify things so that they could provide that care, stop stop or reduce the number of animals they were breeding for those programs until they got back up um, to full speed. And so I think that's an important thing, but really, you know, we have to also think about um, how things are regulated federally. So the FDA, I mean, for the most part, you know, we're not gonna come up with some new vaccine and, and plop it in a person before it's had some level of uh, testing in, in some species. And, you know, this comes back to the thing, you got to choose the right species, uh, depending on what the disease is. You know, there's, there's basic things like safety. Um, and then after that, yes, the, there are human volunteers. Um, you know, they're not all going to volunteer for something that might not be safe to put in them. Um, so that's where the, the pre-testing, I think, comes in. Um, and then the other thing is, if you think about it, the way I look at it is, has there ever been a bigger clinical trial in the world than vaccination against COVID? Um, think of the billions of people who have been vaccinated and look at safety data and efficacy data 
I mean, that's, and that's a clinical trial really uh, in, in the moment. I mean, yeah, the, it, it was tested before it became commercially available um, on, on volunteers, but then once you get it into a bigger population of people across the world and you know, different populations of people respond differently to vaccines, um, I, there's never in my mind been a, a larger clinical trial for something like that. So maybe um, I'll ask, there's only three minutes left. So maybe I'll ask these two questions from the audience and feel free to answer whichever one you think um, is more sparks interest. Um, so this is a question about moral status, but not thinking about the actual intellectual capacities or capacities of the animals, but really the sort of relate, potentially the relationship of the animals to the humans. Um, do the panels perceive any different moral statuses or ethical obligations between wild animals, pets, or laboratory um, raised animals regarding the utilization of those populations with research? Um, and then the other question um, comes from someone that works in transplants and um, there's been recent advances in organ transplants um, and um, cross species organ transplants in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, so what are your thoughts on the ethics of conducting this kind of research from an animal welfare perspective? So um, animal organs to be transplanted into humans. I might make a comment on the first question. Um, and, you know, in, a, in an ideal world, I would like to say um, there shouldn't be a difference between wild animals, pets, lab animals, zoo animals, et cetera. Having said that, particularly wild animals who are not accustomed to, unlike other than things like Scott has done where they've sort of, um, uh, I don't know the right word, uh, conditioned them to you know, not be stressed. Dealing with wild animals who aren't accustomed to being handled or even people around, you know, adds a whole nother level of stress to them that a pet or you know, livestock or probably even laboratory because the laboratory animals are around people all the time, the caretakers. And so I think we do have to at least uh, think about the differences and how we provide, I'm gonna say equitable welfare and care across those species. And some of it's just the nature of them not being conditioned to not fear people. Um, and so that would be my thought uh, on that question. Scott or Rebecca, do you have a thought on that? I would just add that, that I think many people know who Jane Goodall is, but what Jane has been spending almost all of her time now is promoting the welfare of those captive chimps or the chimps that have been used in biomedical research over the last number of years I think most people probably know NIH. NIH has sort of frozen any additional funding. So now, now we're obligated to provide homes for these individuals who could live for 60 years. Um, so in that sense, I think, I think that is as justified, perhaps more justified than similar efforts um, in, in wild situations, just because what those animals have given to us and what we've taken away. I want to add to that, that I, I do really think that we have different obligations to animals that are very contextually dependent um, and based on our prior relationships, um, what we've experienced with them in the past. Um, but I, that's a very different claim to me than claiming that um, that otherwise similar animals have different moral status. And so to me, that just shows you that answering the question about animal moral status doesn't necessarily tell us that much about what we ought to do <laughs> with regard to how we treat them. And so um, I find that a helpful sort of um, way of disentangling um, that kind of um, approach. And I'll say about the transplant uh, case, I've, I've been following it very closely and I'm just like, on the one hand, amazing, and on the other hand, 
uh, and it's so it's just such a fascinating uh, realm of science and um, I'm following it closely, but I have no sort of ethics comments on it. Well, what, it seems like one lesson that we've gotten from this discussion is the way in which the enterprise of research actually could change our moral commitments to the animals in which we interact with. Um, and so thinking about the sort of obligations that researchers incur um, due to the sort of ways in which you are already interacting with the animals um, is fascinating. And um, so unfortunately, this is the time. Um, it's always so short, but I feel like particularly this conversation could have gone on for much longer. Um, I just wanna thank uh, Rustin, Scott and Rebecca so much for being open and just really sharing your own expertise um, on this topic. And to all the members of the audience, um, please look, I look forward to seeing um, you at other um, conversations about research ethics uh, panels that are happening this semester. Thank you again, everybody.